This particular Monday, wow. Okay. Let me keep it to myself. Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. Welcome on the show. My name is Wally Scott. Um, I've got a series of calls from last night till this morning. They, they've turned me into the guru that can pronounce the names right, Abby. It means that my tongue can cut, Abby. So they won't actually get the pronunciation of the name of um, the person in Nigeria is NFF is considering to replace Genot Raw. His name is Mladen Krastojic. Close enough. For the record. <laughs> okay, you, you can, yeah, you can better. Ah, uh, my God. Mladen Kristajic. Okay. <laughs> that will cause problems. But. The Nigeria Football Federation is considering hiring Serbian Mladen Krastajic as new head coach of the Super Eagles. Now, pressure is mounted on the NFF to sack Eagles head coach, Genot Raw, after the national team put up an underwhelming performance against Cape Verde in their quarter 2022 um, Qatar 2022 World Cup Group C final qualifier at the Test in Balogun Stadium, Lagos, last Tuesday. Now, federation officials held a crucial meeting to decide the future of Raw following the nervy 1-0 draw against the Cape Verdeans to evaluate Raw's performance since he had taken charge of the team in August 20, 2016. The Franco-German's current deal expires December 2022, but the Eagles' a recent poor run of form, which included a 1-0 home defeat to Minos, a Central African Republic, in the qualifiers for the 2022 World Cup, sparked calls for his dismissal. It's understood that both the NFF and Roa have entered into negotiations on how to part ways by mutual consent. Now, Krasadzic managed Serbia's national team from 2017 to 2019, leading them to the 2018 World Cup in Russia, where they crashed out from the group stage. I've got Shayo Ogunto on the phone. Shayo, good morning. Beautiful morning to you, Alex. Great to be here. Welcome on the show. Now, let me start with Mokail here, not Shayo. This is a man who, well, he led Serbia mm. to the World Cup. But he crashed out in the group stages. Shouldn't we be looking for a better CV? Uh, Just my question. You know, the position Nigeria is as a nation, and obviously the amount of uh, money on offer, the consideration about how regular that salary will be paid, it limits our options for uh, who we can bring in as manager. Obviously, we all we all wish we could have one of the uh, Mourinho's greats, Klops. And, yes, but it's not going to happen. We're not going to get that. At best, at best, we'll pro at best, we'll probably end up with Hodgson, Roy Hodgson. Um, <laughs> Shio, if I was to count the number of star players who are in the Serbian national team, I would count more in the Super Eagles. Victor Osime, Wilfred Ndidi, Kelechi Yenacho, or Noachu. I won't stop counting. Um, Chukweze. And, and, and you know, we haven't even come to the homegrown, homegrown player. Yeah, so, so really, um, should us be looking for a coach with a better CV? We're looking for a coach that, um, we're thinking about a coach that has taken the Serbian national team to the World Cup, and they crashed out in the group stages. We have done that too many times. We've crashed out. Like... It's our best right to crash out in the group stages. You know, so let's find someone else who has taken a team a notch higher. What do you think, Shayo? Wale, you see, Nigeria is, 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 we are in a laughable condition right now, a pitiable <laughs> one. I will give you an example. Last Lagaba took over Nigeria after he failed to qualify his own country, Sweden, at the 2010 World Cup. Imagine, he failed to qualify his own country but um, we sacked our own late Shuaibu Amadu, who took us to the World Cup, to bring in someone who could not, uh, you know, qualify his country. And then what happened at the end? We still got that at the first round. That is exactly how Nigeria is. We do not learn from history. And I think uh, we just keep evolving around the same cycle. Now, there is no uh, quality coach that can actually, or can I use the word serious-minded coach that can actually come to coach Nigeria? Because... Nigeria themselves are not serious. You, 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 can't, you can't expect the likes of a great A coach to come to Nigeria out of all countries. We've not shown that we are serious. A, a couple of days ago, I, I read a post saying uh, Bonfrey Joe is begging to come back into the Super Eagles. I have that And we know his antecedents. Why not you know, use that as a yardstick? Okay, Bonfrey Joe is done good with us before. Why then? Bringing in a, 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 
I mean, it, it's very laughable I and mean, it's so sad, really. With all the stars we have, we still struggle in Africa. We can't even rub shoulders with the likes of Senegal, the likes of Egypt. We will struggle against Ghana and even South Africa at the moment. Now, Shayo, it, it's, it's so so, Bukai, let me come to you on this. We Nigerians who are sports journalists, Nigerians ourselves, Nigerians in diaspora, foreigners abroad know that we are rich. Mm. Nigeria can pay it, like what Shayo says, a great A coach, you can afford it. Yes. But the truth is, our structure is bad. Mm. We are riddled with corruption, leadership problems, and that's the reason why a normal great A coach will not come here. Not because we can afford him. Yes, it's actually true. But more to the point, we've talked about how limited the development of football in Nigeria has mm. had in the five years or going on six years under Gennett Raw. What we need is a plan, a structure in place to hire a a proper technical team built around the principle that we're trying to develop for a new generation. For the next 20 years, we want to bring in players through our academies, improve our academies, give us recommendations, create um, technical plans on how to improve the technical attributes of our footballers, our young footballers, and the tactical understanding of our footballers. Shia, before we move forward, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, Mukaid has brought in a very tangible source of it. It says, let's try and get a team, a technical team, that is looking towards building a super eagles for the next 20 years. Fantastic. But Nigeria is the only country I know in the world that we don't know what contract they sign with our coach. Nobody, I, I insist, if you see, I know anybody, please tell me now. Nobody has seen Gennot Ross' contract with the NFF. No one. Absolutely. I want to agree with that. And I, I've, I've seen as much as I want to actually fault the natural for all the crisis we've had in Super Eagles, how we've played, no identity, and all the whatnot. I think it would be unfair also to put all the whole blame on the natural now, because uh, looking at um, a team list, or, uh, you know, if he's going to uh, bring out a 30 man list, sometimes, sometimes he is actually being uh, mandated to put a certain player on everywhere so it it, it 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 goes beyond just what we read on the papers it it, it it it's so deep it's so deep and you mentioned corruption earlier it is very very deep into our system and that's why no serious final could can ever come to nigeria except okay. the likes of general draw now let's move forward um she wanted to call him a particular name i don't want to call the person's name i want, I want you to just tell me what name he calls him Fridge. Fridge. <laughs> Manchester United fans dished out scathing criticism of Captain Harry Maguire after his disastrous performance against Watford. The England defender was sent off during the team's 4-1 defeat at Watford, which proved to be Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's final game as United boss. Now, one supporter described Maguire as a lost puppy, while another believes the Red Devils should never have paid £80 million transfer fee for him. I call him a fridge. Um, the last um, speaker now said he, he seems like a lost puppy to him. You know, the first guy says, how can you pay 80 million, and a half, 80 million pounds for Harry Maguire? You know what's interesting about this? When you compare Manchester United's spending and recruitment um, drive against uh, Manchester City, you look at the centre-half position and you have Nathan Ake, who doesn't even get to feature as often, but he's very good. You look at um, Laporte, who's been injured recently, but still manages every time he's back to be a first-choice centre-back. And then there's John Stones and, um, and Diaz. But then... Across Europe, there are plenty of good options. Good options that even Manchester United have been linked to in the past. Um, Raul Jimenez yeah. from Atletico Madrid. Uh, Pau Torres from... Um, Koulibaly. Yeah. These options were there. Shayo, but they spent I am not going to ask Mukail this question because a part of his life is stayed in England. So he will have a little um, loyalty to them. So I won't ask him this. Let me ask you. I think the problem with the English are the English. Because the problem is, they give the, the, their players so much prop, so much hype, and then when they get to the time for them to make it, they break it. They break themselves. Harry Maguire, definitely not worth 80 million pounds. Definitely not. And he has come to show the world that, listen, he's not worth half of that, really. Yeah, I, I want to agree with you that 
you know, the English, they hide over hide their players. Yeah. And um, maybe Ari Maguire does not want that 80 million price tag given to him. Also, he is not a captain material. But is Ari Maguire a good player? I would say yes. Outside United, he has been a fantastic player for England. Oh. And I, I, I want to say this. And I'll, I'll cue in the line of um, Danny Alves when he was talking about one of the most criticized players United have this season, Fred. You know, Fred for Brazil is not the same Fred for United. The difference is very clear. And I think that's the system. They have not got it right. In fact, I, I have to be fair on Ole now. All United coaches have not gotten the system right. You see them uh, having great games for their country. When they come back to United, it's a shambolic performance week in, week out. You know, Shaya, just Shaya, keep, Shaya, like, Shaya, like Shaya, Shaya, I'll come back to you. Now, Mukail. Okay. Mukail, um, technically now, let's go technical now. Hmm. If the coach realizes that the player does better in his team, why not try and fit them into whatever position they are playing in their teams abroad? Because every manager is supposed to. Pogba, we know for one that uh, he doesn't hmm. like to be tutored on hmm. what to do. Hmm. In the French Le Bleu, he just gets a free roll, have hmm. fun. And he has fun and he makes it happen. Why don't let him have fun in, in Man U too? You know, the problem with the um, Manchester United setup is that the midfield is completely unbalanced. The intent was to have a strong defensive midfielder, which was why Mourinho brought in Matic. But Matic isn't the Matic that we saw at Chelsea. He's old. He has grown old. He's an yes. old man now. Yeah. Fred is, well, not as strong as Matic doesn't have the technical prowess as Matic. And is well, often, a Brazilian. But he's often late to, def uh, to tackle. Come back, yeah. So oftentimes you have a midfield that is struggling to find its identity. You have Pogba, who isn't quite a playmaker, but he's not also quite a box-to-box -box midfielder. Um, McTominay is a box-to-box -box midfielder, but he doesn't seem to read his positioning well. Give an example. Maguire has the ball. He's looking forward for someone to pass. But the opposition's attacking midfielder or striker is trying to cut off that option. Um, uh, McTominay always ends up standing right behind the striker, preventing Maguire from finding him with the and ball. And get the ball to him. But once you see him drop deeper and being able to look ahead to find his other players, he's better in the uh, defensive three, which, we, which we've seen in, under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. But otherwise, his biggest problem is his positioning. Now, if they had gone out for someone like Ndidi, or, um, and then when you talk about Pogba, the fact that he plays so well at Le Blues, he has a, a myriad of options in defensive midfield positions. Starting, starting with Kante, which allows him the free row to go and do whatever he needs. He's got Varane, he's got Kante to get the ball to him. And unfortunately, Manchester United play an, a counter-attacking football. Whether they try to change that or not, they play a counter-attacking football. Le Blues try to control possession, which oftentimes leaves plenty of room for every person on the pitch to get involved to get involved and defend from the top preventing situations that Shire moving forward right. moving forward um, the Ajax coach is on the table Zinedine Zidane on the table Mario Pochettino on the table who would you give this job to well if you asked me this question about two weeks ago I would have given it to Antonio Conte but now you're asking me this question presently I'll give it to Eric uh, Dan Hag. He's, Dan he's Hag. a fantastic manager. I, I don't want to give it to Zinedine Zidane because I feel Zidane is sentimental. Some players will still be kept unhappy while some players will be kept happy. So Zidane is practically sound, but he's sentimental, highly sentimental. Okay. Now, some good news this morning. Lionel Messi scored his first goal in league in the French Le Championnat as Paris Saint-Germain continued their near-perfect start to the campaign with a 3-1 win over Nantes on Saturday. Now, Kylian Mbappe put the host in front after two minutes, but Mauricio Pochettino's side were reduced to 10 men when goalkeeper Kaylor Navas was sent off for a foul <clears throat> at Ladovic Blas. Now, Nantes have made it one all through Randall Kolo Mwani, um, but a freak own goal from Dennis Appiah saw Paris Saint Germain retake the lead. With three minutes to go, Lionel Messi, whose previous Paris Saint Germain goals came against Manchester City, and Arabi Leipzig in the Champions League slotted home to secure the three points. Okay, so um, Messi finally gets his goal. 
But in the German Bundesliga, Offenheim ended RB Leipzig's five-match unbeaten run with a 2-0 win. Now, goals in each half are from Daddy Swans coup and, um, of course, Moas Dabo and Short Offenheim jumped up to 10th in the German Bundesliga. Now, Leipzig missed a chance to move up in fourth on the top of that. Small teams don't fear big teams anymore. That was Offenheim against Leipzig. Leipzig are in the Champions League. They are doing very well in the Bundesliga and they get beaten 2 0 right now. Nobody fears anybody anymore. Yes, I, I want to say uh, Leipzig maybe uh, took their foot off the pedal because they are preparing for a Champions League. And I think um, that same happened to Bayern Munich. They lost also away to Osborg, two goals to one. So if you notice, uh, most Champions League teams are, are on, on, the, on the week going into the Champions League, they don't do too well because they rest players and, um, you know, they want to do well in the Champions League. So they prioritize the Champions League m much more than the league, which they can still catch up later. It's a marathon. Shayo, I want to thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Now, Los Angeles Lakers' road win at the Detroit Pistons was marred by wild scenes in the third quarter. Waiting for a free throw to be taken, James swung at Stewart, connecting above the Pistons player's eye. With a bloodied face, players had to hold 20-year-old Stewart back as he went after James, who ejected for a flagrant two fouls. Now, Stewart was also ejected for multiple unsportman-like acts, with the Lakers then recovering from a 15-point deficit at the start of the fourth quarter. Kyle, mm -hmm. jungle don't match all. You know, uh, the frustration, the stress, the emotions that come with the game is beginning to tell on these players now. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that Stewart was on IS3. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't have bloodied the poor, poor guy's face, you know, but it's all in the name of the game. Things are beginning to heat up. It could also be a matter of, um, you know, uh, frustration. Three games they've lost back to back, uh, their last three games. And unfortunately, um, who knows what's going on in the minds of these players at the time that they react? Who knows what Stewart said? Who knows what was going on on the court? Really, we're not privy to the, these things. Maybe the referees are the closest ones to knowing yeah. what went down, but even they have to still do their jobs and maintain some kind of order. It's unusual for James to lash out in such a manner, exactly. especially at his more advanced age. When he was younger, you might expect something like that, but he's, he's an elder state in this game right now and you don't expect something like this from him so it's um, it's unfortunate to watch um, such scenes kind of tarnish the image of the game yeah especially at a time when we're just getting back into the groove of what the NBA should be post pandemic even though technically the pandemic is still it's a still reality here, yeah. it's still here with us yeah. mm. Shayo Gutoye, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you, Mikhail. Of course, UEFA Champions League resumes this week. Yes, we're looking we, forward we, to it. We can't wait for it. Um, I'm going to leave you with um, the ATP finals. Now, it was Germany's Alexander Zverev who capped a memorable year by sweeping aside Russian world number two and defending champion Daniel Medvedev, 6'4", 6'4". Join us same time tomorrow, Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. And um, my name is Wally Scott. Like I always advise you at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports. <laughs>